the land that we're located on. While we are the current stewards of the land, it was not always so. We recognize that for thousands of years before Europeans and others arrived here, there were already people here who were stewards of the land. The Anishinaabe, the Atawandaran, the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga, and others. And before there were people, the land was. As Christians and as Indigenous peoples alike, we acknowledge that the land which sustains us all, the land on which we live and move and have our being, belongs to God, our Creator. Okay, share screen. There we go. Thank you, Kathleen, that was beautiful. I didn't ask anybody to light the candle. Ernie, would you do the honors, please? Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And we take a moment of silent reflection to prepare to worship the Lord our God.
Okay, so for those of you who are online, I would invite you to send in any announcements or celebrations uh, with on the using the chat feature, and I will ask the people in the congregation in a minute. A um, couple of things to go over. Uh, the Heart of Christianity study continues Thursdays at 2 p.m., and that's here at Dorchester or online. And also both churches, choir meets Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. All are welcome, the more the merrier. So for Dorchester, today we are blessed. We welcome the Reverend Larry Schneider and his wife, Gwen. And uh, there'll be more about Larry in a, in a moment, but uh, suffice it to say at this point that we are thrilled to have both of them join us today for our anniversary service, to sing in the choir, to preach the word, and to join in fellowship afterwards because there's lunch afterwards. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder about the pumpkin campaign for the Raja family. Thank you for all who have um, contributed to either in material goods or financial. Um, and Kathy indicates that we're going to, to wrap up this initiative at the end of the month. So I guess next Sunday would be it. So thank you very much for everyone. And um, the Raja family is due to arrive on Thursday. And there is an apartment uh, for them as of December the 1st in London near um, all the services that, that they're going to need access to. Uh, for Union United Church, uh, just a reminder, October outreach is the Elgin St. Thomas and the Port Stanley Sparta food banks. And November the 13th is the 202nd anniversary service there. And our friend and former General Secretary of the United Church of Canada, Nora Sanders, will be the guest speaker at that service. Okay, so I see a whole bunch of chats here. Uh, da -da -da -da. So are there any birthdays, any anniversaries, any, Carol? Um, Dolly Summer's birthday was on Friday. <clears throat> Dolly, you're 29, plus shipping and handling. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, just happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, God bless you. And there was one thing on the chat, um, Mr. and Mrs. Kaiser. I believe, are celebrating 55 years of happily wedded bliss. Congratulations. Okay, so where are we going to go next? The call to worship. So um, Bill and or Ina are going to lead the congregation in the response, so there might be a little pause, so... Allow for that, please. We come here to worship God, to speak to God of our hopes and dreams, our regrets and fears, hoping God will draw near. We seek proof of God's presence with us, proof that we have found favor with God, and finally, proof that we matter that we are loved by our creator. That is why our forebears built this place of worship. That is why we come here each week to this cleft in the rock, hoping to catch a glimpse of the glory of God. 
Let us worship the Lord our God. And our opening hymn is number 516. Come, you thankful people, come. be seated. Okay. So our guest speaker today is well known to you here. It's the Reverend Larry Schneider, and he is an ordained minister with the United Church of Canada. And Larry was ordained in 2015 after a career in education. And I heard that from people that he was the principal for your children. So um, he's taught English and was the curriculum coordinator for the Elgin County Board of Education, vice principal at West Elgin Secondary School and Central Elgin Collegiate Institute principal at West Elgin Secondary School and London South Collegiate Interest um, Institute. And he's been on long-term disability for the past five years. Larry was a minister here at Dorchester from March of 2012. So that would be before your ordination. So you were a student here. And then uh, for two years after your ordination till September the 2000, 2017, when illness intervened. Gwen and Larry live in Rodney, have three adult children, four grandchildren, and have been married for 43 years. Wow. It brings Larry great joy to join us in worship today. You know, in a race, we'd pass the baton, but we're not in a race. 
so we'll pass the microphone. Thank you. Hello, hello. Is this thing on? Well, what an absolute joy for Gwen and I to be here with you this morning. As somebody uh, once upon a time said, it's good to be back. And it's amazing. Look at all the familiar faces out there. And uh, I, for fear of missing anybody, hi, Don and Bill and Ina and Billy and everybody else who's... Sorry, I'm looking behind me at the screen. Um, everybody who's joining us via Zoom, um, I just wanna pause and have a moment of silence um, for all of those folks who I used to stand here and look up and see who are no longer with us. Let us bow our heads in a moment of silent remembrance. Oh, Amen. Well, we're here today to celebrate your anniversary and anniversaries um, of, of marriages and birthdays and so on are wonderful times where we can sort of reflect, well, here I am. How did I get here? Um, and we celebrate with the others who are still around us. So I am extremely glad to be able to stand before you. Last time I was here on a regular basis, of course, I think I was going, I had pretty bad vertigo, but I was not willing to uh, admit it. Um, but it is great to be back. So just a word about our, our family. Um, you met Parker, our oldest grandson, who's four, because I, I left here in the fall of 2007 and then thought I was well enough to come back in the spring of 2018. I wasn't well enough to come back, but you, I'm a pretty stubborn guy. You couldn't tell me that. Um, so you met Parker. He's now four in junior kindergarten. His mummy, Catherine, is at teaching junior kindergarten at John Wise and Parker go to the locks. Um, they have a, a daughter, Violet, named after my mom, Violet Grace, named after Gwen's mom. And she's one and a half. So she's off to daycare. Our son, Andrew, has a son, Heath Leroy. The Leroy comes from Gwen's dad. And um, he's going to have a sibling on January 23rd or thereabouts. Our last three grandchildren were all born at least a couple of weeks early. So we don't know about these due date uh, things. I don't tell time so well. I just said, baby's here. And I said, oh, there's a new baby, another baby. Um, and, that's, and then Megan, our baby, has a one month old little boy named Lawson Scott. And the Scott was Gwen's dad's first name. So family names are well represented there and of course everybody's madly trying to figure who do they look like they look like themselves with maybe a, a dash of this parent or grandparent and one of that but so those of you who have been celebrating in my time with you about being a grandparents i know some of you great grandparents i get it so that's one of my things i'm going to talk about what we should feel and think when we first wake up in the morning for me, that's just about number one. Our kids are doing well. Catherine's teaching. Megan is on mat leave. She's the general manager of GT's in Port Stanley, the restaurant bar there. So she's been the boss for three years. Now, and Andrew works from home predominantly uh, as a sales agent for West Elgin Mutual Insurance. The lady, the lovely lady, well, one of the lovely ladies in the choir behind me, Gwen, retired from her role as an educational assistant. At, oh, oops, I stuck my hand on my own wire there. Uh, Gwen retired a couple of years ago uh, as the pandemic was getting going from Alderborough Public School. And so we're doing well. Um, I am a survivor. Uh, everything about me has changed. My brain was radically altered. So after five years, the United Church of Canada still has not decided that I'm fit to return to regular 
ministry. I've been pushing against that. I had my, think, my final cognitive behavioral assessment via Zoom this past week. And if that goes okay, then I would hope to return to part-time ministry in the coming months. So thank you so much for all of your kind words and cards and prayers while I was sick. I felt the love. I know that uh, Reverend uh, Bruce wrote a prayer um, that was shared not just throughout this church, but from through a variety of other, other congregations where I was known. And People told me they were praying for me in churches that I'd never actually set foot in. So that was a very humbling yet uplifting experience. Thank you. Let us pray together our opening prayer. We come before you today doing our best to be humble and contrite, seeking your presence with us now, your forgiveness with us this day, your grace with us always, awakening Jesus once again in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. Amen. Now there's a tradition that Gwen and I had started while we were here, and that was to, I would go back and sit in this back row and we would sing. So I'm about to do that now. I'll take this off because you don't want to hear my voice that badly. Thank you. 
should have seen me trying to put my hearing aids on while I was in hospital. Just not a possible thing. Well, that was wonderful being back there again, singing uh, with the choir. Thanks to Kathleen for driving to Windermere a month ago to give me that music. I was there doing a wedding. And so we rendezvous because she really was excited about having us here. Do I see any young, young people out there? Not seeing any. Oh, there, Keith, oh, there's that young lad, Keith, at the back. The whiskers threw me off. I don't think they were there the last time I was here. Well, I would, if children were here, I would talk about this amazing array of harvest items. You've got everything from onions and tomatoes through to the gourd family. And of course, they come in such an amazing variety of colors and shapes and sizes, <coughs> just like we do. So we are all like pumpkins. We grow in the pumpkin patch or wherever Charlie Brown believes that we come from. And uh, you never know how we're going to turn out. We depend on the weather and the rain and the sun and the warmth and a kind gardener who maybe has fertilized the soy and provided all the nutrients we need to grow big and round and strong. Um, and then what's on the inside? Some of us have a lot, a lot of seed for planting the next year's crop. So pumpkins be, can be very oriented towards the future. They can prosper. They can provide the seeds and our gardens, we never know what's coming up. Is it squash? Is it pumpkin? Because everything goes into our composter and then the seeds. So we end up with sunflowers and uh, butternut squash and acorn. And sadly this year, no pumpkin. So grandpa had to fake the pumpkin harvest from our raised garden beds uh, for the grandchildren so they could have something uh, to carry. But when you make a jack-o'-lantern, you can make it a, a a pumpkin into something pretty scary. So too people can become pretty scary and grumpy and sullen and angry and filled with fear. All those emotions that all those wonderfully decorated pumpkins can express. But then what do we put inside the pumpkin? A candle, a light. There's a light inside each and every one of us that can shine out to the world and beautify that gnarly old face. And maybe there are even pumpkins, jack-o'-lanterns, maybe you'll create one this year with your grandkids, perhaps with a smile. Might not seem very Halloween-esque, but there you go. I won't tell the conclusion to that because you can figure that out. We are the pumpkins. God provides all the necessaries for us. And it's really up to us to discover our own individuality and create a glowing, beaming persona, if you will, filled with faith and love and shining out to the world. Our next hymn is number 278 in the quiet curve of evening. Thank you. 
reading the first one. Okay. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Psalm 65, uh, continuing the theme that uh, has been through our lectionary scripture readings for the last month, not surprisingly this time of year, thanksgiving for earth's bounty. Praise is due to you, O God, and to you shall vows be performed, O you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those whom you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you established the mountains, and you are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with riches. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, and the hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Our second reading from Joel, the second Chapter verses 23 to 32, God's Spirit poured out. O children of Zion, be glad and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for your abundant rain, the early and the later rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army, which I sent against you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame." You know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I, the Lord, am your God, and that there is no other. And my people shall never again be put to shame. And then afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men and women shall see visions even on the male and female slaves. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood 
before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. A bountiful life. And no, I don't mean a life full of paper towels stocked away in your closet in case we run out like some people did with toilet paper a couple of years ago. Our first hymn this morning I, has set, I think, our hope for, and subject for today's service. But first, I have a question for you. What was the first thought that went through your mind when you woke up this morning? Or yesterday morning? What day is it? It's in our line of work, it's important to know <laughs> what day it is. Any other first morning thoughts or yesterday or last week? What a beautiful day. Yeah. Turning to the choir. Any, anything you thought when you woke up this morning? There is a cat. And thank heavens for cats. You should talk to the lady next to you about us getting some cats at some point in the uh, future. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I wake up and I'm full of thanksgiving and gratitude. I, I've said to several of you, of you this morning, I'm doing better than I deserve to, better than I ever hoped to. Who would think I'd be alive now to be here speaking in front of you awesome, wonderful people, singing with that? choir, seeing my four soon-to-be-five grandchildren coming along and reaching, well, I hope next year, 44 years with my lovely wife back here. Because um, none of that seemed possible. Three and a half years, I couldn't speak. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't walk. When they moved me out of bed, I was in one of those lifts where you lift and move over and then plunk down in the wheelchair and then off to whatever came next. I actually died twice. And I was so sick, they called the family in and said, well, what, what do you want to do? What, what's going on with him? And we've never really talked about that. I knew I was really sick. I didn't really think I was going to die, but I was prepared for it. Um, and I was not conscious for a long time. I would just, my conscious mind would be put to sleep. And then at the, the end, I wasn't awake for three months, but some other persona in my limbic brain would take over. And he was not a particularly nice person. So I think my family is quite glad that that fellow went away, but not sure who this guy is because I'm not the same guy. I don't have the same abilities, capabilities. I think I'm really funny apparently now. And I never stop talking. So there's a clock on the wall. So at some point, uh, I'm, but I'm filled with gratitude. Like, how can this happen? How could this happen for my family? for the people who get to hear me talk too much now, and for me, it's, I, it's just a miracle. Uh, so I am filled with gratitude, and I've been busy. I write articles every week in the local paper because people seem so damaged by the lockdowns and COVID. And so I'm just sort of a cheerleader on the side now, doing service club stuff and trying to get free books to all the children in the universe and, uh, and so on. And it seems to be working, and somebody nominated me and I got this lovely award earlier in the year it's called the Queen's Jubilee so I had this pin from Queen Elizabeth and I cried and cried when she died because I felt even though she'd been my queen my whole life as with most of you that wow so, somebody's paying attention that some of us are trying to do every day what God asks us to do well this is the season of Thanksgiving we give thanks. We've been giving thanks. Now, to whom do we give thanks? And for what are we so thankful? Um, the words from our scriptures this morning specify the yield from the field and the harvest home and uh, gathering us together 
free from sorrow, free from sin, and purified, if we will but believe and approach God, as, as it says there, the survivors that Jesus calls. We have all been called. It's up to us each and every day how we're going to answer that call. But today's hymns, the anthem, and our scriptures focus our attention on this amazing overflow of everything, life and all of its wonders, the bounty. And yes, I know bounty was once a ship. For you historians out there, it is a paper towel. Strangely, it's a reward given if you capture a criminal or you catch a coyote. There are bounties on animals, which are especially important to people who are sheep farmers, as our neighbors in West Elgin were when we first arrived here. But the bounty I'm talking about is an abundance, a plentiful glut. That just means there's way too much. It's a prize and it's a gift. The bounty of our lives are the gifts given to us by God. On a previous occasion, a number of years ago while I was standing here, I referred to our former United Church of Canada moderator, Marty Tyndall, and she made what was just an amazing distinction that stuck with me ever since. We can have one of two attitudes. You can have an attitude of scarcity. There's never enough of anything. I can't get enough of this. The other end of the polar linear line is abundance. I just got so much of everything. I, life is good. Life is blessed. That's where the, the grateful attitude comes from. God has given us all of the things enumerated here and so much more. And God reminds the people of Israel of their deprivation, their want, their hunger, and their being lost, so that they should truly feel thanks for their delivery out of Egypt. But what did they do once they'd been out there in that wilderness that they'd longed for? But once they were there, they grumbled, they created false idols, they made a certain gentleman so angry he threw down some stone tablets and broke them because of their ingratitude, their fear mongered. Rather than believing strongly, they feared for their own personal safety and existence. Now, and yes, the, the, the existence of their families, and I don't mean in any of what I'm saying today to belittle the fears and the anxieties that people have. I'm just saying we let them overwhelm us, overwhelm us when they really shouldn't. We grumble. If you, if you care to look at social media any day, it's filled with grumbling about the state of our lives, our economy, the prices, taxes. We lament you know, the wait times for doctor's appointments, ambulances, um, the price of food, rough roads, plug drains, our aches and pains, and the fact that there are mosquitoes. But, yeah, those, those are all actual concerns. If I had a loved one who needed to get to hospital and needed an ambulance that's stuck, you know, at the hospital with the previous patients waiting to get into emerge, I know it's horrible, but wait a minute, compare our medical system to that of virtually anywhere else in the world. People who in their entire lives never once see a nurse or a doctor have never seen a hospital and never will. Who never have been on a paved road and never will. Who have never had a full stomach on any day in their lives. Quite frankly, without any offense, folks, we are spoiled rotten, as my mother used to say. We're spoiled rotten with the excess of the bounty of our lives. So, yes, it's normal to grumble when you can't get what you want or think what you think you need right away. God never promised us that we'd have all of our wants and our needs fulfilled immediately. But he did promise that he'd be with us each and every moment. And uh, so I've got days when I'm in incredible pain. 
Um, and my brain just doesn't work. I just have to close my eyes and say, okay, one thing I can't do now is math. I can't tell you what day it is and I can't tell you how long I drove to get here and I couldn't add up uh, 10 numbers in a row. If you told me your phone number and I wrote it down, it I have numeric dyslexia now, it would be scrambled. So I just deal with it. Is it frustrating? Well, occasionally. Does it ruin my day? No, um, unless I'm being audited by Revenue Canada. And uh, what is this all about? I don't understand it. Um, and we blame, we, we like, as Jesus became the scapegoat for all of the ills in his world, we like to blame others. We have traditionally blamed people of other ethnic and country origins. We love to blame our government. The government oh, has such little control over anything. The government's trying to keep the lid on a society and an economy where we've agreed that it's okay and it's wonderful and it's amazingly good for a very small group of people to own everything. Absolutely everything. So they're called the 1%. But is, do you know the name Warren Buffett? Don not Don, Bill Gates. I won't go on and list others. I could list sports figures, actors. There's this fame that accrues. Oh, he or she's getting paid $8 million to throw that little white ball and catch it and sometimes hit it with a bat while people are starving somewhere. I just, the whole system to me doesn't make a whole lot of, of sense because we've allowed greed and the acquisition of stuff, of things, of money, to be the opposite of what Jesus says, is when you get anything like that, you immediately give it away. I've, I've been preaching the last few Sundays, and so the scriptures for uh, Thanksgiving actually said, when you harvest, before you do anything else, you pay your tithe to the church, and you give away a portion of your harvest. Before you ever put a meal on your own table or a check in your bank, you must, as a Christian, give some away. Somehow that's got inverted, and um, there's a version of American, that's a very gen general statement, uh, Christianity that is, the more I got, the more religious I am, and the better God will love me. I don't remember any time that Jesus actually said that. So... I mentioned gratitude and abundance. If you think that there's not enough of everything, you're going to be grumbly and angry and frustrated every day. And that is a main theme in what so many people who I personally know, that's what they think, that we are going to hell in a handbasket and nobody's helping us out. That is so untrue. Think of all the people we celebrated during the pandemic. Anyone in emergency care, in medical care, they, those people burned and are continuing to burn themselves out for us. Firefighters? Well, yeah. Farmers? Well, yeah. So where and who are these people that are not working together for everybody else. It's easy to pick on an individual. It's like people say, oh, teachers, oh, they're just in it for the holidays. They're so lazy. They don't do anything. Okay, we'll follow one teacher around for one week and you'll still be disabused. Um, I know when I was an English teacher, I'd come home boxes full of assignments in binders at Christmas, and that would be my Christmas holidays. I wasn't on a beach somewhere. I was marking papers. And every summer when I have these long summers up, I took a course virtually ever, every summer. And if we took a holiday, I, I would take a course and then we go somewhere or, or vice versa. So, but everybody knows the excellent teachers. It's like everybody knows their favorite excellent banker or lawyer or car mechanic, but the rest of them are all crooks. We're not grateful for the skills and talents of other people. I'm not saying people are perfect. I'm not saying that at all. But when we, you accentuate 
and think and truly believe the negative, that's what your reality will be. That's the scarcity mindset. The abundance mindset says, I am loved. I am loved by people around me. I am loved by God. I'm loved by Jesus. We are all God's children placed here for one purpose, to love one another. And it's hard to love when you're filled with fear and anger. So set it aside. Get over it. Those are emotions. It comes from an attitude, and any attitude can be changed. So love others, enjoy the harvest of all good things in our world and in your world, because these things give us the energy and the ability to strive for our individual and collective success. We strive to live lives, as Jesus promises, lives filled with peace, joy, love, and the hope of eternal life in Jesus' warm and comforting arms. In glory, never alone or lonely or cast, cast aside or isolated, but embraced always. That's something I kept near and dear to my heart in all of these dark times. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your men, old men and women shall dream dreams. We can, in our minds, we've been given the gift of imagination and creativity. We can imagine a better life for ourselves. Uh, and we've all seen videos, and probably plenty of them, of people living in the most dire or extreme circumstances of want and need, who are laughing, who are happy, who are dancing for joy, because Jesus loves them. God loves them. And they know we have so much to celebrate. Life itself. Our church as a whole, this church, Dorchester United Church, and all the churches that have come before, such as, and I'm going to name some that I know that are now no longer open, Crumlin, Wallaceville, Appen, and all those that used to exist where you used to tell me you went there as London grew bigger and all that land was taken over. Several churches were sort of overtaken, and some of you are here or some have gone elsewhere or, or nowhere. Um, those churches serve to create tradition that we celebrate today. How do we worship? Why do we worship? And they set amazing examples of faithfulness, of endurance, of getting through the tough, really rough times. Um, that depression you hear of, that was a hundred years ago, but that was when my mother lived through that. She was born into that. And we all have those kinds of connections. Today, we celebrate all of those who came before us in our churches. We celebrate the continuing wonder and glory that is God that we enter into this mystery every time we gather together, whether it's on Zoom or in person or even in quiet prayer in our homes. We're, so today we celebrate the present, we commemorate and celebrate the past, and we look forward filled with hope for the future. And yes, are things going all okie dokie in the world of the church? No. But are we okie dokie with continuing our role and spreading the gospel? and doing good? I hope that we are. And we all have issues, and health are some of the nastiest ones that can sap our energy and our will. We, we carry on carrying on as long as, you, as you, we can. So may God bless you all as we remember and celebrate, resolve to gratefully step out into this world, not just beyond these walls, but taking their meaning and our joy with us in all of our steps as we go along the world 
as we will sing momentarily. And it's, and it's from the old, I travel to the new, keep me traveling along with you. Well, I manage that in three different keys, sorry. Um, amen. My pages are sticking. We are called to be the church. We are called to love one another. We are called to reach out in faith and in hope. We respond to that call with our lives, with our time and our skills, with our tithes and offerings that the kingdom of God would be made manifest here and around the world. Let's bring before God our tithes and our offerings. Loving Creator God, we thank you for your many mercies, your love, and the gifts with which you shower us every moment of our lives. We present to you now but a token and a portion of what we express when we intone and pray, thank you. Thank you for your substance, our sustenance, and our sweet Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Here we are, dear God, coming before you again today in heartfelt prayer. Bless us and keep us as we continue along this pathway that is our life, our meaning found in living out Jesus' commandment to us to love one another, to put ourselves not at the front of the crowd, but encouraging others to join in to love and worship you. Forgive us for what we have done that goes against your will and for those potential acts of generosity, kindness, and forgiveness, which we have so far left undone and unrealized, unspoken or unfelt. Encourage us now and inspire us with your word and to into our hearts today, healing and encouraging us, comforting and blessing us, so that we might truly earn and maintain the name of Christians, known by our love and selfless sacrifice for others, as Jesus gave for us. Bless and comfort all who suffer from the lack of that which is necessary, who suffer from the pain inflicted by other human beings. natural disasters and the terrible effects of human-induced climate change. Where there is food insecurity, bring sheaves of grain and plentiful manna. Where there is drought, bring rain and warmth and renewal. As the crops mature and the harvest begins, let us give thanks and pray that this bounty will be a bounty for all, nourishing us on our often troubled and turbulent journeys. Make us ever mindful of the needs of others and our needs, so that we may pray for enough, as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
I read something a few weeks ago, which made me go back and look at and rethink the Lord's Prayer, which I've been saying probably since I was four or five years old in Sunday school at church. It's a prayer for enough. Enough for the day. And nothing more, nothing with fancy curly cues on it or racing stripes. No um, cheesecake or pie. I'm a food guy, you might remember that. Enough. Our daily bread, let us forgive others and please forgive us and, and keep us out away from, keep us strong of character enough to keep us away from temptation. Well, now we're going to go back out into the world, restored and renewed by our worship today, and we'll sing about this in One More Step Along the World I Go. The blessing may, uh, may sound familiar. It is the UCW benediction. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us and upon all our work and worship done in his name. May he give us light to guide us, courage to support us, and love to unite us now and forevermore. Amen.
turn to the right page. So we're going to say from the Apple page, everyone knows that, right? Okay. Uh, 